Okay, um, so we're going to continue on our, our journey through external flows today by um, revisiting this idea of the boundary layer, right, which I introduced um, a couple times earlier in the semester. Um, but today we're going to talk about specifically uh, the, what we call the external boundary layer. And we're going to try to achieve two main things today. First is describe the uh, the metrics of an external boundary layer. And secondly, define laminar versus turbulent boundary layers. Okay. So we discussed laminarity and turbulence in the context of, of uh, pipe flows previously, but now we're moving that to flow around objects, uh, where things are essentially the same, but um, there are some subtle differences. So um, I'm also going to be jumping back and forth. I've got some figures that are too uh, complicated to draw. So I'm going to quickly here jump over to a couple of slides. Um, this is something I wanted to, to, to get to in the last lecture, but we ran out of time. Uh, and this describes and the sort of in, in two sets of figures uh, the behavior of external flows both with changing shape of the body as well as with uh, changing Reynolds number. So let's break this down a little bit. Um, the Reynolds number we're choosing to use here, right? The Reynolds number here is being defined as rho u times some length over the dynamic viscosity. Now, uh, in the left-hand side, we've got these figures here. Uh, show the flow around what we we'll call a streamlined object. That is something that's relatively thin. And when we have a streamlined object with a length L, the idea is that it doesn't very strongly deflect the, uh, the streamlines around it, therefore the name. So at the top, we've got a fairly low Reynolds number. Okay. And it increases as we move, oops, and it increases as we move down. So increasing values of the Reynolds number. So at low Reynolds numbers, right, Reynolds number represents the balance of uh, viscous forces, or sorry, inertial forces over viscous forces. So at low Reynolds numbers, about 0.1, this means that viscous forces are very, very important. And for that reason, a large region of the flow, in fact, everything that here is shaded gray, uh, sort of feels the effects of that viscosity. And the way that we, we, uh, we know that is because the flow is slowed down everywhere inside of that, that gray region. As the Reynolds number increases, first to a value of 10, and then to a value of 10 million, the region where the flow is then slowed down, okay, in this case we're using the criteria of it being less than 99% of the free stream flow velocity, uh, the region where that's occurring is shrinking closer and closer to the body until at very large Reynolds numbers, these, those viscous effects are confined to a really, really tiny layer of flow adjacent to the body, which is coincidentally called the boundary layer. Now let's just focus for a moment and look at the right-hand side figures. Here we're defining uh, that L term, okay, to be the diameter of this circular cylinder. Okay, this is a good example of what we call a bluff body. Well, the body is anything that is not particularly streamlined. Very scientific description. Uh, but at low Reynolds numbers, once again, we see that, that a very large region of the flow is dominated by viscous stresses. Okay. As we increase to around center, in this case, of 50, but you know, order of 10, uh, we see that the region where viscosity is dominant is shrinking, once again. Um, but now also there's a separation points, and this is what defines a bluff body flow, is one where the flow 
it tries to contour to the body and stick to it, but at some point, it, it can no longer hold on to the body and it breaks free. It creates what we call a separated wake, or in this case, a separation bubble downstream of the body. And at larger runs, it's not just being increased further and further, we again have this very thin <laughs> region of flow where the viscous effects are important. However, we retain that separation point. The idea here is um, as, the, uh, as the inertial effects become dominant, okay, as the round number increases, eventually that inertia of the fluid moving around the body is too great. It's sort of like a car going over a speed bump. If you go too fast, you're not going to hold on to the ground very well. Okay, same idea is um, occurring here. So the, uh, the, the, the takeaway is that as the Reynolds number increases from very small values to very large values for a streamlined body, the area where viscous effects are important decrease to this vanishingly small boundary layer adjacent to the body. And for a bluff body, as the boundary layer increases, again, the viscous dominated region shrinks until it's closer and closer to the body. But in addition, we've got these separation locations. So the viscous effects are important very close to the body, but also in this separated wake behind the body. Okay. Now, the reason we concern ourselves with this distinction Okay, is because, whoop, let me bring it back up for a second, uh, or the reason we really concern ourselves with this is, uh, we've described at this point, we should understand that the math when we've got viscous flow, okay, necessitates that we use Navier-Stokes equations. Whereas outside of viscous dominated regions, we've got much simpler math to contend with. And so we've got this guy named, Uh, we've got this guy named Ludwig, oops, I guess, Ludwig von Prantl. Um, in fact, he might not, am I mixing names up? I am. It's just Ludwig Prantl. There's no von in there. Um, this guy named Ludwig Prantl, who uh, generated this idea of the boundary layer. And he's the guy who first came along and said, hey, I think the viscous effects are con constrained at high Reynolds numbers flows to be very near the body. Um, and outside of that boundary layer, we don't have to worry about viscosity very much. So he's the progenitor of this idea of the boundary layer. Um, so the, the idea is, uh, so he, he uh, say viscous effects are confined to flow very near an object's surface, which we call the boundary layer. Now, clearly, um, this applies only to right, high Reynolds numbers and to bodies on which flow separation has not yet occurred. And so this this, uh, this hypothesis of the boundary layer favors streamlined objects. This very simple hypothesis here is probably the single most important contribution to fluid mechanics ever because it, it is the first time that fluid mechanicians were actually able to approach uh, problems of practical significance using the math that made, you know, that was actually tenable. Things like um, uh, the Bernoulli equation. All right. So it's also really surprisingly intuitive. So let's really quickly draw a schematic of what the boundary layer is telling us, 
or this idea of the boundary layer stylings. So I want to consider a point here. So in this, in this little schematic here, we're going to say that the boundary layer is this region here. And this on the right indicates the velocity distribution. So we know that out here, in here at the body, right, the velocity has to equal zero. Okay, that's a boundary condition imposed by the, uh, the zero slip uh, condition. And we know that out here, outside of this boundary layer, the velocity is equal to okay, capital U, which is the free stream velocity. All right, we're going to say that uh, U is the free stream velocity. So the boundary layer, its purpose really is to form this transition region where we can go from the zero velocity of the wall to the free stream velocity and the outer flow of U. And uh, in fact, my favorite um, description of this comes from, I think I may have mentioned this class before, uh, this 1920s book by a guy named uh, Herbert Glauert, who describes the boundary layer as being a fluid sort of analog to roller bearings. He says, right, we know that in the same way that a roller bearing allows an object to move past a stationary one through the rotation of solid elements, in this case, the boundary layer allows a free stream velocity to move past a, uh, a stationary object by the uh, in fact, there is fluid rotation occurring in the boundary layer. Um, okay, so we know that inside, let me, I'm going to move this down a little bit. I ran, out of, ran myself out of space. So inside of the boundary layer, we know that u dy right, has to be greater than 1 if y is defined as positive away from moving away from the wall, right? because the velocity is increasing from 0 to something that is non-zero. And because of that, our fluid rotation, right, which we're defining as one half uh, dv dx minus du dy, right, this cannot be zero. In other words, the flow is necessarily rotational, and because of that. Viscous effects have to be important, right? Wherever there is these velocity gradients, we know that shear stresses are going to occur due to the fluid uh, the relative motion between fluid layers. Outside, okay, outside of the boundary layer, because we're assuming that u is simply equal to the free stream velocity, that tells us that the u dy is going to be approximately equal to zero and therefore omega z is going to be zero. In other words, the fluid is irrotational and therefore effectively inviscid. So that's the beauty of the boundary layer right there. Um, so inside of the boundary layer in this region, the velocity has to increase smoothly from this value of zero to the free stream velocity. Um, so there's no really, this idea of like how thick is the boundary layer, where does this green line that we're saying is the edge of the boundary layer, where does that occur? It's kind of a nebulous idea. 
because we've got this continuous and really asymptotic approach from zero to the free stream velocity. So this is where we get into what we call boundary layer metrics. So there are three common descriptions of the boundary layer thickness. <coughs> the first of these is defined as delta, or, right, this is a little bit redundant, the boundary layer thickness itself. And the way this is defined Defined as the height at which the velocity y at y equal to delta is equal to 0 0.99 u. So let's uh, break this down for a second. So there's the saying is that because there's no really the, the boundary layer in 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 truth. Is infinite. The velocity is always going to be moving slower, right? Closer to the body. And because of that, you're only going to ever have an asymptotic approach to the free stream velocity. So there's never a point where you can say mathematically the uh, velocity is 100% of this free stream value. Because of this, um, and, and fluid mechanicians will forever fret about this. And so at some point, it said, ignore the fluid mechanicians and the scientists and we'll pick a value where the velocity is close enough to be effectively equal. And that 99%, it turns out for, for, um, for very subtle reasons that we're not going to get really into, is a really good number to use. So for this reason, this boundary layer thickness or boundary layer height is often written as delta 0 0.99 to indicate that this is the 99% boundary layer height. Um, so there's a guy, I didn't really, I, I, we really can't, we don't have time to get into this, but there's a, uh, a solution to the boundary layer equations um, that was worked out by a guy named Glossius. Uh, he was actually one of the students of Ludwig Frankl. Uh, and what he did is he said, all right, for the, the case where you have a flat plate and a laminar flow, there is a way to actually exactly solve for the Blasius solved for u as a function of y for laminar flow past a flat plate. Okay, this is sort of a, an aside. Um, and he did this using a really elegant change of variables, um, which allowed him to turn a, a simplified version of the Navier-Stokes equations that you get in a boundary layer into a solvable, nonlinear, ordinary differential equation. Um, and by solvable, I mean it's something you actually have to crunch using numerical methods. Nowadays we do it with the computer. Back then they did it with a bunch of tables and effectively hand-worked uh, spreadsheet. Um, but from this, this Blasius solution, which still stands as really the gold standard for a laminar boundary layer, uh, if we plug this, um, this, this now defined uh, velocity distribution from Blasius, we get that this delta of 0 0.99 is equal to 5 times the root of mu x over rho times u. Okay. If we reorganize this a little bit, we can say that delta 0 0.99 over x is equal to 5 over the square root of the Reynolds number 
defined on x. And let's talk about what this means here. Okay, this, this Reynolds number defined on x is simply rho u times x over the viscosity. It's just like the regular Reynolds number we've been using, but instead of putting in a fixed length, or L and the, uh, the argument there, um, we let it be a function of x. Right? x has dimensions of length. It's dimensionally homogeneous, uh, or really it, it's dimensionless. Um, and this, these two expressions here, right, the, the left and the right, this um, red one and this green one here, they tell us two important things about the boundary layer. First. say x, and we have y, and let's say that we, this bottom of this is a flat plate. It starts here. We've got a uniform flow coming in with a free stream velocity of u. Um, this tells us that the boundary layer first increases with increasing x. Okay. We get that from this, uh, this, this red asterisk version of the equation. So, increases in thickness with increasing x. And it does so with a, with a square root. The second one, okay, this green one here, tells us that if we pick a point, okay, if we pick some value of x, let's say we, uh, we, we stuck uh, some sort of measurement device right here, okay, we pick that value of x and we calculated the Reynolds number at that value of x, what happens to the boundary layer thickness at that point as the Reynolds number increases? It's going to get thinner. In other words, if we were to mark ourselves at this location so that x is fixed, x here, and the x here, and we were to increase, for example, the velocity of the incoming flow and increase the Reynolds number that way, as the velocity increases, the boundary layer at that fixed position is going to get smaller. Okay. This comes back to that idea that as the Reynolds number increases, the importance of viscosity decreases. Okay, that region of viscous dominated flow shrinks. Okay, so this defines the first boundary layer metric, which is the true um, uh, boundary layer height or boundary layer thickness. Okay. The second boundary layer metric, number two, is what we call the displacement thickness. So the idea here is let's let's uh, draw a little oops, a little sketch of a boundary layer. And let's say we've got a let's let's put a control surface right here. Um, this is like one you know one edge of a control line that's enclosing uh, flow. But we're interested in Understanding the flow just across this control surface. Um, compared to a uniform flow, right? If we said that it had the whole thing had a velocity of capital U all the way down to the surface. 
Compared to that hypothetical inviscid flow, there's a deficit, in a sense, of how much mass is crossing this control volume. In other words, if all of this red shaded region is how much mass is being sort of held back. So I'm going to draw another hypothetical flow. If we wanted to, uh, to, to reproduce this sort of uh, mass deficit using a inviscid velocity profile, <coughs> we could approximate a, that we have a uniform velocity profile except for this region of flow or this region near the wall where the velocity is zero. And we want to understand how thick does that layer of dead stagnant flow need to be so that it represents the same amount of mass not crossing a control surface. And so if we say that this is our, right, our zero, our 99% velocity um, or 99% boundary layer thickness, we're calling this new kind of uh, modeled uh, layer of stagnant flow, the thickness of that we call delta star. And this is what's known as the displacement thickness. So we can calculate the thickness of this displacement uh, layer pretty simply if we, if we think about how we calculated the flux across a control surface. Um, the mass, flux, oops, deficit could be written right for the left, the integral from 0 to infinity, because right, the boundary layer is technically infinitely thick, um, of u minus u of y, okay, all times rho dy, all right? This is to give us effectively the area of that, the, the red shaded area. We want to say this is equal to, oh, I'm sorry, this is going to be equal to u times rho times this displacement thickness delta star, which is the red shaded area on the right. So we're saying these two things should be equivalent to one another. And so what we get from that is that delta star should be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 minus u y over u dy. And uh, unfortunately for us, we don't really, we don't have this expression for u of y. I should mention that, that, that Blasius equation. We don't actually get a function u of y. What we get is a, a tabulated list of, of numbers. Again, I said it's a numerical solution, so we don't have a smooth, like, closed form expression. Um, but because we've got that tabulated list, we can do a, a, a numerical approximation to an integral. And we can figure out that for the Blasius solution, that is for a laminar boundary layer, the delta star is equal to 1.721 times mu x over rho u. Or delta star over x is equal to 1.721 over the root of the Reynolds number based on x. So we've got the same sort of form as the 99% boundary layer thickness, but uh, it's only about one third as thick. 
Now what this is useful for is figuring out uh, things like if you've got uh, right the boundary layer, we know that it grows thicker in the direction of flow, A along X. If you want to understand how that affects the, uh, like the blockage that an object represents, if you place an object in a wind tunnel, okay, the boundary layer grows thicker. That means that there's going to be less mass uh, flowing around uh, the, the object because of continuity. We know that, that effectively that, that increase in the boundary layer thickness represents a decrease in the area around the outside of that object. So the flow is going to have to accelerate in order to go around the object. Um, I've got an example to, uh, to demonstrate this. Oops, here we go. Um, and then we'll jump back to the third boundary layer metric and wrap up. Uh, so we'll consider a, a duct. I know this is an internal flow problem, but we're going to treat it as if it's external flow because it's a square duct, not a peak. So this duct is two feet by two feet, or sorry, one foot by one foot square with a velocity of two feet per second. Um, and we know that, right, intuitively looking at this and drawing it, we know that the boundary layer and therefore the thickness of this displacement layer is going to increase in the direction of flow. So if we don't account for this, if we left our duct a constant one square foot cross section, then the thickening of the boundary layer is going to mean the flow through the center is going to kind of speed up, right, to fit the same amount of uh, volumetric flow right through it. So the designers of this duct want to know, all right, how do I have to modify the dimensions of the duct so that at the center line we have a constant two foot per second velocity? How do we do this? Well, the whole premise here solution, is that we want Q at every cross section of the duct to equal Q naught, which is our right, two feet per second times one square foot entrance area. Two feet cubed per second, right? This is just a statement of the continuity equation. If we're ignoring compressibility, and at two foot per second velocity, we certainly should ignore compressibility, um, then the sum of the in has to equal the sum of the out, and any two sections we draw. Right? So this says then that Q, at the same time, is going to be equal to the local flow at x right, times D, which we'll label as being the width of the duct at the entrance, minus 2 times the displacement layer thickness squared. Right? We're saying that D, oops, D minus 2 delta star. And we know, right, so D then has to be equal to, if we solve this, right, that Q of two feet per, cubic feet per second, Q over U plus two to star. And we know that the displacement layer thickness is equal to 1.721 x over rho u. And so plugging that in for d, we're going to end up with this need to be 2 right, cubic feet per second over that 2 feet per second plus Two times one point seven two one. It's the square root of. Um, we're going to go ahead and replace this Reynolds number with. Oops, 
over mu. We're taking uh, the kinematic or dynamic viscosity over density, and calling it kinematic viscosity. I'm square root of the kinematic viscosity of air, which is 1.57 times 10 to the negative fourth feet squared per second over 2 feet per second times right, the square root of x. Which will work out to a numerical value of about one, right? At one foot plus 0 0.0304 times the square root of x feet. So that's the purpose of the displacement layer thickness. There's problems like this where we want to understand how much the flow is being slowed down in some places or how much region is occupied by that reduced flow velocity, uh, and therefore understand how that's going to affect the flow outside of the boundary layer. A problem like this, right, this is telling us that unless our duct is really, really long, then the, uh, that, that initial two feet per second isn't going to accelerate very fast, because the, um, the narrowing of the flow region inside the duct is occurring very slowly. Okay, from one foot down the duct, it's going to be only about 0.03 feet, okay, which is like less than half an inch. Um, and moreover, this isn't a very practical approach to figuring, to, 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 to improving on that or to negating that acceleration of the flow. Because um, if you're able to find a manufacturer that gives you a duct that increases in square dimensions, by the square root of its length, and you're going to be paying a lot of money for that kind of manufacturing. Um, a better approach might be to linearly increase the duct size, right? Something a little bit simpler. But um, this gives you the tools to calculate. Any questions on that example? All right. Uh, so let's wrap up with the third of our boundary layer metrics, which is called the momentum thickness. So the momentum thickness is a lot like the displacement thickness, except that instead of understanding the layer of dead fluid that represents the same mass flux deficit, we're now interested in quantifying the thickness of the layer that represents the deficit in momentum flux. Now, this is useful for things where we want to calculate the drag on objects, right? If you use a control volume analysis to understand the difference in momentum flux in and out of control volume, you have the force on that control volume. Um, so, once again, we say, all right, we've got this, this region of flow. that is not carrying momentum across that control surface. So we want to equate it to a completely stagnant region of flow that does not carry exactly the same amount of momentum. So the way we do this is by, uh, or so we define the thickness of this layer as capital theta. <coughs> so this is the thickness of a stagnant layer with the same momentum deficit as, again, the real boundary layer. So similar to before, we can use a pretty simple uh, integral expression here. So integral from 0 to infinity oops, of uy times oops, capital U minus u of y rho dy is equal to 
bro. You squared. It's theta. So solving for theta in this case will give us integral from 0 to infinity u u times 1 minus u of y over capital U dy. Again, unless we have an expression for uh, velocity distribution, this isn't all that useful to us. Luckily, Blasius plugged it into his solution and Blasius to the rescue again. We get that theta is equal to 0 0.664 times mu x over rho u or that theta over x is equal to 0 0.664 time over the root of the Reynolds number. So just like the displacement layer thickness was only about one-third of the 99% boundary layer thickness, the momentum thickness is likewise only about a third of the displacement layer thickness. But um, they all increase right, with the root of x. Uh, and we've got the tools now to calculate the, all of those thicknesses. In the case where we have a laminar boundary layer. All right. So now, quickly, in the last couple of minutes, this will only take... Um, this will be very fast. Uh, discuss laminar versus turbulent boundary layers on ex and external flows. And we discussed these for internal flows. There's a difference here, right? In the, uh, in the case of an external flow, there we go. Um, let me go ahead and draw it, actually. This, is, this will be cleaner. Laminar and turbulent boundary layers. Um, we, we deci decided whether a flow is laminar or turbulent based on the Reynolds number with that length term as the diameter in a pipe, right? We said if it's less than 2,100, it's laminar. If it's more than 4,000, it's turbulent. If it's between those, it's eh, something between those, right? Um, so I've defined this local Reynolds number already. The local Reynolds number... Right, this R E X is equal to um, rho U X over mu. And so I want to consider flow past a flat plate. So we have a uniform velocity profile coming in from the left. We're going to define a coordinate system, plus x, plus y. And we know that the boundary layer is going to start at the leading edge and grow. Right. I'm going to put a plot below it. Got x, and on the y-axis, it's got the Reynolds number based on x. In other words, we've got a constant u, we've got a constant rho, and a constant mu. But in the direction of flow, x is increasing. So with it, the Reynolds number, the local Reynolds number, is also going to be increasing, and it's going to do so linearly, right? It increases linearly with the distance from the leading edge of the object. At some point, yeah, let's pick a better number here. At some point, boom, we hit what's called the critical Reynolds number. Okay, this is similar to that like 2100 to 4000 range in pipe flow. This is a value at which the flow generally stops being laminar and starts to become turbulent because viscosity becomes less important than the inertia of the flow itself. And so we can then calculate the critical location where this flow transition occurs and project that up onto the plate and say at that location the boundary layer is going to go through this very sudden thickening and increased turbulence. Turbulent 
laminar. Okay, all of the equations I've given, given you so far are for laminar flow because laminar flow obeys the mathematical rules. We've got turbulent boundary layers are still an open area of research. People are trying to attack it using machine learning, using uh, new like fractal uh, method, methods and chaos theory and a lot of math that's, you know, harder than I can handle. Um, and so we don't get into turbulent boundary layers very much in this class. Uh, instead, whenever the flow is turbulent, we tend to rely on dimensional analysis and empirical uh, relations that we get from those. So consider now like that velocity of fluid particle that's following the flow as it hits first the lamina, uh, the lamina boundary layer. Okay, and the lamina boundary layer is going to be deformed because there's fluid rotation, because there's shear going on. And at some point, we hit that critical Reynolds number, which tends to be around, I think the book gives you like 200,000 to 3 million or something. It's a really big range. Um, the number I've always been told and the one I always kind of use as my, um, my rule of thumb is that when it hits about 500,000, that's a good estimate of when flow transition will occur. Okay. So you can find the point where flow transition occurs by setting your local Reynolds number equal to 500,000, solve it for x. And so when the flow hits that point, okay, that transition region, it's going to stop going through this nice parallel sort of shear deformation, and it's going to start getting pushed, pulled, and sheared, and torn, and rotated by the turbulent fluctuations that occur in the turbulent boundary layer. So when the Reynolds number is less than critical, well behaved, and we have the velocity of solution, okay, as well as the uh, attendant boundary layer thicknesses, the 99% thickness, the displacement thickness and the momentum thickness. When it's turbulent, we've got this large scale elasticity, which creates enhanced mixing, chaotic motion. Um, and I discussed, right, that because it's better mixing things, it tends to push regions in higher velocity closer to the wall. So we go from this laminar velocity distribution to a turbulent one, which is really flat near the bottom. In other words, at high velocities, right up really close to the wall. don't have an expression, right? Velocities didn't, wasn't able to do uh, a, a, a numerical solution for the boundary layer velocity near the wall. All we have are empirical estimations. Um, so that's going to wrap up today. Uh, quick announcement, and I'll send this out when I come as well. Friday, we're going to be uh, we're shuffling the schedule a little bit. Instead of doing drag uh, on Friday, we're going to move one of the class activities up to Friday. It's a it's a sort of a uh, class reflection activity. So those questions that I had you submit on ICON at the very beginning of the semester, where it was like some question you were wondering about fluids, I hope to be able to address through this class. Um, we're going to be coming back and looping back and, and trying to answer those as best we can. Um, so I'll see you guys on Friday.